All right, to everybody else, uh, we are on Discord, so please join us on Discord today if you'd like to. The reason why we have Discord is because the webcast lasts for an hour, but Discord lasts for forever. And so if you are here seeking knowledge and camaraderie and community, the best place to get that is in our Discord server. Uh, many years ago, we we realized that you all had fun comments and insightful things to say while we were presenting. And we were like, well, what if we could get you to meet each other? Uh, and so that's why we created the Discord server so that you could meet each other. Because if you're here, then you have one thing in common. And that is the fact that you're seeking knowledge for information security. And so since you have that one thing in common, there's a good chance you have a lot of other thing, things in common. So join us on Discord. So today uh, we have DevOps Red Team initial access. And so Josh is going to be talking about all the things that he does, mostly at, at Black Hills. Uh, we are a red team, threat hunt, pen testing, active sock, anti sock company, and we do this every single day for a living. And so, if you ever need to hire us for a service, you know where to find us. But Job's going to say, like, "Hey, here's what I'm doing. This is what I'm seeing. This is how I'm creating. This is what I'm making. And this is this is what we're uh, doing in our services. And so, this is how you potentially do it for yourself, or potentially know that it exists so that you can defend against it." All right, Jeff, any questions before we get started? No, I think let's just jump in. All right, Jeff, it's all yours. I'll see you uh, towards the end. If anyone has any questions, you can ask in Zoom at any given time or on Discord because your fellow attendees may be able to answer this before we can. All right, that's it. Excellent. Thanks, Jason. All right, so uh, DevOps for Red Team Initial Access. So I I, uh, I put this presentation together um, after sort of, I would say two and a half or three years worth of work in this area. And so it turns out that the content of, of this presentation is kind of dense and could branch out into an entire class. It could branch out into multiple presentations potentially. Um, so uh, just bear with me on that because I have this real habit when I do these presentations of trying to dump my entire brain at that particular moment. And um well, it's kind of fun, right? Uh, first of all, the meme game uh, of all of you in the Discord audience is fabulous. Uh, some of the uh, pictures on the screen are directly out of Discord. Uh, uh, Orthicon uh, created the hello there meme out of the Yoda. Um, much appreciated. And I don't know where the Python one came from. But anyway, I'm Joff. Uh, I work for Black Hills Information Security. I'm an anti-siphon instructor as well. I teach an introduction to Python course. Uh, I teach an enterprise attack emulation and C2 implant development course as well. Uh, that one's mostly on demand. I teach some regular expressions, uh, which is a four hour uh, course. And uh, I do a lot of uh, research and dev and initial access operations work. My unofficial title is sort of malware pit boss uh, at Black Hills these days. Uh, I do have um, a number of people actually working for me now uh, as uh, malware devs. And so we've got some interesting uh, sort of vertical integration of our uh, red team and assume compromise engagements uh, that are going on these days, which uh, helps bring us success. Um, I was trying to pick the title for this presentation and I went back and forth, DevSecOps, SecDevOps. And then I was like, really, it's just DevOps for security professionals because I'm actually kind of perverting DevOps in a way that helps us generate a unique malware or securing malware. No, it's not about securing malware. This is uh it's kind of a Jedi mind hack uh, use of CICD is what I'm going to get into. Before I go there though, let's talk about our defense landscape today. And for anybody that's in red teaming uh, or uh, initial access operations for assumed compromise and stuff, you guys know that, um, the EDR, XDR markets are very, very strong these days. Uh, the defenses are very strong. If you have a mature customer that you're working with uh, that has invested in some of these technologies, has deployed them correctly, has tuned and configured them correctly, then you have a formidable defense landscape uh, in front of you. You have these kind of um, major hurdles or topics, if you like, to overcome uh, when you're talking about trying to place an implant or uh, on a system or get some initial access operations working. So, you know, static artifact analysis is the sort of lowest bar, event tracing for Windows, Windows kernel mode callbacks, 
uh, DLL API hooking, process tree analysis, memory page scanning, call stack tracing and analysis, kernel driver block lists, and so on and so forth, right? All of this stuff now, this, this massive amount of feature set is implemented in uh, most of the uh, EDR, XDR technology that, that's out there. Now, if you're not in the business of using an EDR, XDR, you're back in the good old days of uh, just depending on consumer grade defenses, then I'm not really talking to you, right? This is the more advanced enterprise style, oh, drink everybody, I said enterprise, uh, defense kind of stack that we're in front of, right? So let's kind of break out a couple of these things really quick just to talk about them. First, static artifact analysis, right? This is, when I talk about this, I'm talking about direct malware hash matching in VirusTotal and Friends or other databases that keep hashes of known malware, right? Um, just some sort of shell code or machine code uh, in a byte sequence has a patent to it. And even as a part of a binary artifact, uh, unencrypted shellcode can be matched and flagged in static artifact analysis as being malicious and is often uh, flagged as malicious. The other control that we often trip over is a uh, high entropy of uh, binary artifacts. And, and this is uh, literally a result of either compression and encryption or both uh, of some kind of portion of the binary artifact that you're delivering into an environment. And by compressing, uh, and or encrypting, uh, you are essentially introducing a very big blob of binary data that is statistically flat in nature, and it will raise the entropy of that artifact. And that becomes a IOC trigger for a lot of the defense code that's out there. And it will trigger on that, um, even that alone, right? Or any little telltale thing in an artifact that is unique to that artifact, any little hook basically, that a defense product can get its hands on. Uh, event tracing for Windows, just really quick. Uh, this is something that uh, we all uh, fight with uh, in the industry uh, if you're on the offensive side, because event tracing for Windows is a pretty effective measure for being able to give the uh, defense product uh, tele telemetry about what's going on on their system, right? These are trace and log events raised by both user mode applications, by kernel mode drivers. Um, the event tracing API has basically got three components. It's got controllers, providers, and consumers, right? The controllers are, uh, are creating sessions for event tracing. The providers are supplying events. The consumers are the, that which is ingesting events. And it's a published subscribe style model that's at work with uh, ETW. Um, there are three types of providers. There's the MOF classic mode, the WPV instrumentation based mode, uh, and then trace logging, which is what is, is providing the actual ETW logging. Now, event tracing for Windows is a very effective mechanism for providing telemetry, albeit a noisy mechanism. There's a lot of tem tele telemetry, oh, that's a tough word, that is provided in ETW. Uh, kernel mode callbacks uh, are also leveraged heavily in the Windows NT kernel ever since uh, Vista. I know that's a terrible word to say because Vista was kind of a, a, um, a one of the middle products, I said, uh, before the, the next one came along for Microsoft. And, and we all know it was a tough transition. Uh, but kernel mode call, callbacks uh, were put into the Windows kernel when Microsoft made the decision to stop allowing the uh, defense industry products to hook the service dispatch table in the kernel. They said, look, you really need to stop mucking around with our kernel. It's a problem. You destabilize our product. And they said, we are going to introduce a technology called PatchGuard. And as a compensating mechanism, we're going to bring forth kernel mode callbacks which allow you to, again, subscribe to various object notifications in the Windows kernel. So there's the uh, PS set create, create process notify routine, for example, which will give you a notification when a process is created, create thread notify, load image notify, the ob register callbacks, which uh, for all objects, process thread, desktop handles, and so on, when they are opened or duplicated, that will actually send a notification back. And then the... Uh, a register callback itself for registry operations. So this, 
this entire technology here that Microsoft introduced for us was essentially um, a compensation for what they took away uh, back in those Vista days. And it is used um, quite quite uh, effectively uh, today by various defensive products. Uh, another concept that's been around for quite some time uh, is Windows uh, anti-DLL API hooking and other DLLs, frankly. Uh, so what is a hook? Uh, when, we, when we look at a hook, uh, first of all, any, any process that is loaded on a Windows system um, is 100% going to load anti-DLL. Uh, and it's also going to load uh, kernel 32 dot DLL and kernel base dot DLL. The, these are the API layers, uh, the Windows API, essentially in the Windows operating system, uh, they're going to be common to, to, to every single process. Now, there'll be other dynamic link libraries that are loaded uh, with Windows processes, and you, we can always hook those as well if we want to. But on a per process basis, it is possible for us as malware engineers or defensive product engineers to replace the second machine code opcode in any of the API calls, uh, if we look specifically at NTDLL, so that um, the five bytes that are there allow us to perform a jump instruction over to some other uh, routine that's in another DLL that gets injected into the process, such as an EDR or XDR DLL. And that, that process of placing those five bytes in and creating that jump uh, is called hooking the API. So you could hook a create process API and force it to jump over to an EDR DLL, which, which gives the EDR some kind of notification routine, right? Hooks are often initiated in response to a kernel callback notification, right? So these concepts actually can come together where the EDR driver today receives some kind of a notification in response to that, injects the process of, of concern with its own DLL, which in turn places a hook, and that hook does some other API hooking in anti-DLL or other APIs in, in the process, right? So there was a period of time, and this is, um, to my knowledge, become a little less popular now, but EDR and XDR DLL hooks uh, for a while there were installed or placed in almost all processes uh, in uh, the kernel uh, before essentially the defense industry started writing drivers to receive the callbacks. Now that they've written drivers to receive the callbacks from the kernel notifications, they're tending to do the API hooking in an on-demand kind of fashion, right? I need to hook something because I see something that's come at me that is kind of suspicious. Furthermore, there is more recent technology now uh, with memory scanning and call stack tracing um, that is sort of changing the way that the defense industry uh, is actually examining uh, some of the process behavior that it's seeing when it's searching for malware. Uh, here's a diagram that I drew up based on various other sources of reading that, that I have uh, at my disposal over you know now a couple of years. This shows the concept of how uh, an EDR or an XDR uh, product might end up hooking uh, a, a user mode process that's actually uh, in memory, right? So first of all, step one, the uh, malware runs and it uses some NT API call like create process, create process EX, create thread, create thread EX. A, a, a process, a, 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 sorry, an API call that the EDR thinks, huh, this is a little bit suspicious, right? Well, how does the EDR receive that? Well, it uses something like event tracing for Windows to receive that telemetry, right? The second step, though, um, is that uh, the, not only will you have ETW for uh, for Windows for the for the te telemetry, you'll also have the fact that. Um, the EDR or the XDR has registered uh, in the callback function table to receive some of the kernel notifications. So now it has a choice. It can either it can either depend on ETW or it can depend on the kernel notifications. It depends how the product's written as to how it's going to respond. But let's say it receives that notification one way or the other, and it goes, "Okay, create thread EX was called. This is super super suspicious." It goes ahead and 
notifies up to its user mode process, hey, go ahead and inject a DLL into this, ma what I think is a malware process, and we're gonna hook some more APIs so we can get more detailed information. And we may even start doing some call stack analysis or memory scanning, right? So this is roughly how the process is probably going to go. Now, of course, I'm not privy to the internals of uh, various EDR, XDRs. This is from what I know from the research that I've done, right? Uh, there's also the concept of process tree analysis, originally deriving from uh, Carbon Black was the revolutionary product at the time. This is quite some time ago that started this idea. So the idea here is that you're monitoring and tracking uh, process relationships uh, you can generate and build an internal process tree data structure and then look for anomalous relationships, you know, and then the classic one would be, you know, hey, why is winword.exe launching, you know, uh, uh, malware process.exe, whatever, or loading a, a new DLL? I mean, that that looks like an anomalous thing uh, or there's an anomalous process tree relationship. I need to actually look look deeper at that. Right. Uh, process tree analysis, uh, you know, they'll, they'll use uh, AI models on the Internet to compare with known good behaviors uh, and uh, to to identify statistically what's in bounds and, and what is potentially out of bounds and what could be considered a uh, suspicious uh, memory page scanning. More recent technology. Right. Malware is going to typically allocate a virtual memory page in a process for some sort of malicious code. Uh, that malicious code will often be. Uh, some kind of known shell code. Uh, when I say machine code and shell code, I'm really meaning the same thing. It is machine code that is injected into the process uh, for the purposes of running a thread. Uh, and the thread is going to be maybe a Cobalt Strike C2 channel, maybe a Brute Retail C2 channel, something like that, right? So an XDR EDR product uh, it, it can... Uh, you know, again, based on uh, kernel notifications, can initiate an NT query information thread to determine a thread start address, uh, then get the memory section properties, and then look to see if that start address is backed by disk or not. If it's not, it's already suspicious. And if the memory is set to read and execute, um, and uh, if it decides that those two conditions are true, then it's a very high likelihood that that thread in that particular process has been injected. But it can take a little bit further and scan the first X number of bytes of that memory page and say, oh, and not only do I know that this thread is injected, I know the first X number of bytes match a typical Cobalt Strike payload. You're out of there, right? And you are, you are uh, done. Call stack tracing and analysis. Um, so this one's a little uh, more uh, complex to understand. Whenever you uh, call a function uh, in a machine, uh, the return address of that function gets pushed onto a stack. And uh, upon returning from that function, it pops the address back off the stack to populate the instruction pointer before continuing with the uh, you know function that called that particular function. So th this is how... Your, your classic von Neumann architecture operating system works. It's creating stack frames as each functions are called, and then it's unwinding those stack frames as the functions return. Uh, so EDR and XDRs can now uh, and, and do now use a kernel callback to trigger a potential call stack analysis. And it's going to be a similar sort of pro uh, process here uh, that occurs. It, it finds something in the notifications that is suspicious, it injects a DLL, and the DLL's job is to unwind the call stack and check to see if any of those function calls were made from unbacked memory. And if they are, by unbacked memory, I mean there's no DLL on disk uh, that, that is associated with that function call. And if they are made from unbacked memory, flag an alert uh, and, uh, you know, uh, say basically that this is this is a function call from from uh, a page in memory that's just been allocated that has no DLL associated with it, has no other image information associated with it, uh, and maybe kick off a memory scan as well, right? Now, related to this, um, in modern 64-bit binary artifacts, the PEcof uh, P data section uh, contains some exception handling information 
uh, about function table uh, entries. Uh, so P data can actually be used to um, help identify legitimate functions uh, because the exception handlers have to actually unwind the stack and generally print some sort of information uh, about those functions uh, during a crashing uh, or exception handling situation, right? So slightly related concept there. Um, from an offensive perspective, it is possible to fake the uh, stack callback so that it looks totes legitimate, right? Um, which is awesome until you get to uh, Windows 11. And this is something where I've got to give Microsoft some uh, uh, some kudos here. Uh, in Windows 11, if you uh, have a processor that, that supports it, and you enable kernel mode hardware enforced stack protection, uh, the Windows 11 uh, kernel with hypervisor support and the processor support will maintain what's called a shadow stack uh, on a per process basis. And when, well, if, should I say, um, the legitimate process stack does not match the shadow stack, then that's immediately uh, a situation where um, the process is considered, um, you know, malware, evil, doing something wrong, however you want to put it. And, you know, various things could happen. The, the process can be killed. Uh, you could blue screen of death just to say, hey, the shadow stack doesn't match. I'm out of here. I'm done. So that's a really, really uh, great advance uh, for um, stopping all sorts of things, uh, certainly stopping uh, virtual memory pages and function calls with, with from unbacked memory pages, but it also uh, would really get in the way of a lot of ROP chain activity um, in in legitimate malware as well. Excuse me, um, and um, you know, frankly, is is um, a good protection. All right, so here's the challenge, though. Uh, it turns out that um, Windows, as usual, uh, has a legacy problem, and the legacy problem is. Uh, there are a lot of older drivers out there that do very strange things in memory. Uh, and uh, um, near as I can tell on my reading, uh, if you enable the kernel mode hardware enforced stack protection, uh, and then you load up your machine with various uh, drivers and, and pieces of software, a lot of people are finding that that, that the machines are actually just crashing. Uh, so it, it becomes a, a, a legacy kind of uh, challenge there. And then another technology that's out there for defense is kernel, kernel driver uh, block lists. Um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, our world is full of vulnerable signed kernel drivers. Uh, and I said signed, like that's really sad, right? Um, again, with Windows 11, uh, Microsoft is now enforcing a kernel driver block list, uh, which is uh, growing uh, as uh, vulnerable kernel drivers are identified. Now, this is, as you might imagine, really not an easy list to maintain. Now, this is a tough thing because exploiting signed vulnerable drivers is a really juicy and attractive target. It takes some significant skills as a malware author, and I happen to have a person who works for me who's very, very good with uh, kernel exploit development. Uh, but when you get to the kernel level, if you manage to exploit a signed vulnerable driver, um, you can then do all kinds of things. You could bring your own further vulnerable driver, drop it, load it, and then use that to further exploit the kernel. And by further exploiting the kernel, you can fiddle with process protections. You can overwrite kernel notification callback tables, as in disable them entirely. You can disable driver signing. You can, you know, you've got control of everything, right? Um, the challenge at the kernel level for malware authors is if you fiddle with kernel memory and you don't do it correctly, you really can get into trouble. Uh, kernel development is a real skill uh, and uh, <laughs> the old bug check, blue screen of death uh, thing will occur to you if you get it wrong as a malware development. All right. So all of this is to say, right? This is like this giant sort of overview of kind of where we are now. This malware dev shit got real, right? If you're trying to 
put some sort of malware or emulate a threat adversary on a desktop machine today uh, that uh, that the customer or the, you know the, the entity has got finely tuned XDR and EDR has the resources to deploy that stuff. It's really difficult, right? It has become um, not not as easy as it used to be. So, for, I mean, for example, to succeed, we have to, you know, first of all, make the software continuously unique to avoid any static detections, uh, squelch event tracing, uh, make any kernel notifications not interesting or even better, turn them off, uh, avoid getting our NTDLL and our process hooked, um, unhook it or just not use NTDLL, make our process relationships not very interesting, no, don't create any suspicious non-disk back thread, uh, threads, right? Evade all sandboxes and don't use a driver on the block list. That's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of stuff, right? Furthermore, in my particular case, because I run uh, a lot of the vertical malware integration and dev work um, around uh, Black Hills, uh, everybody wants to ask me for features now, right? Hey, Joff, besides all that other stuff, that entire stack of defense that you've got to evade, can you give us some .NET assemblies, you know, that are both DLL axes? Can you give us some native Windows axes, some native DLLs? I'd really love to have an MSI package. Can you throw in an AppX, MSIX, and click once? How about a service exe? Could you drop me an XLL that I can load into Excel? How about reflexive injection? And more and more and more and more and more, right? right? So what do we do? How do we respond to this? And this is when I... Uh, in discussion with a number of the red team uh, folks, uh, because when you get more brains together, tell me, uh, let me tell you, you get a better result. Everything we decided pointed to continuous integration and continuous development. What we need here is an entity that can do code obfuscation, source code recompilation, dynamic encryption key generation, automated packaging for things like MSI click once, AppX, MSIX, binary artifact signing, integration of third-party tools as needed, dynamic regeneration of indirect kernel system call stubs, SysWhispers 3 is an example package, basically continuous defense evolution, right? So we were joking. It was actually Corey and I one day on a call. We were joking around. This is a couple of years ago. And, and Corey's like, you know what? Be really cool. If I could just like give you some shell code, push it up to a Git repo and uh, have it just build a bunch of malware for me. And we had this minute, I was like, oh my God, that's exactly what we need to do. And we're like, why don't we just do that, right? So everything sort of pointed in that direction and, and, and you know, GitLab Community Edition and CICD uh, is actually a nice uh, combination. There are other ways to do this, but we we sort of stuck with GitLab. Uh, and it's not just about software repos. I mean, you can have a pipeline configuration in GitLab's CICD just by creating something called a GitLab-CI.yaml file uh, in a repository home directory. And the YAML syntax allows us to define these build stages and the different jobs that we uh, that we need associated with each of those stages. We can trigger the pipeline run simply by a git commit and a push or a merge. We can uh, define our own trigger conditions. Uh, we can also have dynamically created child pipelines as well. All right. So you, you step back and you look at this and you're like, all right, that's great. We can do all these things, but its focus is on continuous integration and continuous development. We're going to pervert it and refocus it on Continuous integration, well, sort of, really continuous dynamic artifact production, right, is what we're going to do, uh, right? C-I-A-P, just a, there's, there's a new acronym for us. I, I made that up right now. But that's really what we wanted to do. I don't really care about the um, CI-CD pipeline testing the quality of the malware itself in the production pipeline. I care that it just generates lots of malware artifacts for my testers to be able to use. So we can define these things called GitLab runners. And a GitLab runner is installed on a standalone server or a virtual container. The runner uses the GitLab API to register itself 
and service these pipeline runs. And then the runner processes all the instructions in the YAML file, and in most cases runs a script indicated by the script tag. Um, in my case, I deployed both Windows and Linux-based runners, and the backend architecture today looks more or less like this. There's a couple of big fat honking Linux servers and a couple of Windows servers. The Windows servers are running the full Visual Studio stack um, along with some additional uh, packaging utilities such as Mage and Make MakeAppX, et cetera. And the Linux servers are running uh, Ubuntu uh, 2204, uh, LTS running Docker. And each of those hosts has eight Docker containers that represent individual GitLab runners. And those Docker containers are highly customized uh, GitLab runners to perform software compilation, be it C, C Sharp, Golang, whatever. So this has now become this giant architecture. And then sort of on the back end of this thing, uh, there's a NAS storage array, uh, which provides a shared storage uh, for the entire thing. Uh, and in fact, they're running as a Docker swarm in the case of Docker with the Docker stack technology as well. So suddenly I literally through the, 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 the course of a single discussion, uh, we built up to this point of uh, turning in, turning ourselves into uh, CI/CD uh, or, or, or DevOps uh, engineers for malware. All right. Now, remember, I want you to keep this in context. We're a penetration testing company. Our job is to emulate threat actors. And so by doing that, we are creating these dynamic, unique artifacts to provide the best diversity of emulation that we can for our customers. That's that's what we're doing here. I'm, and, and yes, they're highly evasive artifacts. Um, and yes, some, some succeed and some don't. And yes, it's a continuously evolving entity, right? So this, I, I'll call this thing Zulu Foxtrot uh, Docker container. That's that that's that references for you, Jason. Uh, it's a custom malware source code compilation framework. Uh, it supports different modules using a Python command line interface. Uh, currently, this this particular flavor container uh, supports uh, C sharp. It supports GoLang. It support, supports C and C plus plus compilation. It's a Linux based com container. It has a full GoLang installation. It has a uh, mono installed there with C sharp MCS, uh, and it has Ming GW uh, GCC installed in the container as well. Um, additional features in here include resource script definition and execution, source code templating and obfuscation system, a binary artifact inflation system, various evasion modules in multiple languages, things that are designed to uh, bypass AMPC, bypass ETW, uh, some PE cough analysis and PE checksum uh, fixes as needed, and all integrated in with a GitLab runner, right? This thing's great. So what we do is we have this pipeline. This is a typical uh, GitLab pipeline stage run where we push up the configuration and potentially some shell code, not always, for what we want the pipeline to consume. And it starts running through the stages of the pipeline to produce a vast array of malware artifacts that our testers can use on the back end. So it has a preparatory stage, prepare A0 here. Then it has what I call a baking malware stage, which is a ton of compilation, C sharp, C, Rust, Golang, you name it. It produces all of this malware. Then it consolidates it down, produces a manifest in a text and HTML format then it does some post-processing work where it creates click once packages, MSIX APEC packages, and any other packages that we want it to produce, right? And then in the final post-processing stages, it zips all that stuff back up together and presents it back to the tester for use, right? And believe it or not, this thing actually holds together and works. 
Now, we went further and we have some parallelized jobs in these Zulu Foxtrot containers, for example, right? Remember, I said there was eight Docker containers running on each Linux server, and we can scale that up or down with Docker Swarm. There's eight, 16, whatever we want to do. And when we fire those jobs off, it will fire off separate little resource scripts for the C sharp compilations and obfuscation for the C compilations, for the Golang compilations, and so on. And they will all be spread across those 16 different containers. Now, more recently, we introduced Rust into the picture um, with uh, yet another um, container that's running on the back end, and we broke the whole thing. Um, unfortunately, we had a little bit of some older hardware, which uh, these containers were being run on, and we had, I think, uh, currently about 16 cores per Linux box. Well, as soon as we threw in the Rust compilations as well, and you can imagine the le level of uh, parallelism here, uh, the Linux boxes themselves, I actually jumped on the back end and was watching one day, the load average on the Linux boxes jumped up to like 50 to 60 as it's trying to run all these parallel compilations at the same time. So we are going to upgrade the back end uh, to be um, some minim minimally 64 core uh, boxes to uh, fix fix some of that on the hypervisors, right? What what this thing really represents in terms of its control plane is a whole bunch of Python and YAML playing together. The master parent pipeline script is in a GitLab CI.yaml file, and that's a static uh, script in the repository. Various Python scripts are called from this GitLab CI YAML file to generate more CI/CD YAML file content. And the YAML file artifacts get passed down from one stage to the next, allowing us to do things like fire off dynamic child uh, pipelines. Um, here's a screenshot of some of that scripting uh, that we have going on that just kind of shows you what's going on. So. You know, we have stages up the top of the malware generation. We've got A0, baking malware, prepare B0, triggers, post-process, and history log DB. Um, then we have some trigger rules here with the workflow uh, text. Uh, and then uh, what you can see in the A0 pipeline, which is the prepare A0 stage, uh, you, there is some Python scripts in there called prepare child pipeline one and prepare child pipeline two that actually generate some more YAML. Uh, and that YAML is used as a dependency trigger to fire off child pipelines. And the dynamically triggered child pipelines may be various malware frameworks, right? And they're in the baking malware stage where it picks up that child artifact and then executes the instructions in that child pipeline artifact uh, YAML to do the uh, malware baking uh, that is needed, right? Like this, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about coming to a presentation is you come into this thing and I'm presenting a beautiful rosy picture of how all of this works. And you're sitting there thinking, oh my God, this is absolutely fab. At least I'm hoping you're sitting there thinking that. This is absolutely fabulous. But you're not seeing all of the warts that went into it before this presentation. This is a lot of time in development, right? How does the operator actually drive this thing, right? At present, there are two basic steps for the operator to uh, drive uh, this, uh, what I am now fondly referring to as malware as a service. Uh, they would edit a file called buffetconfig.yaml to enable features and configure different options. If needed, they would supply shellcode in 32-bit or 64-bit form uh, into a specific directory. And then the operator just performs what I call a YOLO commit, which is git commit dash a dash m dot and git push, basically shove the shell code and the configuration up there and then monitor the pipeline progress and download the resulting zip files when they are complete. Have I spoiled these guys or what, right? All, I, all you do is edit this stuff and I generate you all these great artifacts as a result, right? 
So here's an example of the uh, buffet config file, right? You've got different options in there. It's plain text YAML. It's relatively easy to understand. You can set a win ver variable here. You can set an, I showed you a little uh, subset of the payload inflation uh, module where you can enable it. You can set a target payload size. You can even, even set a fixed PE checksum option. Uh, if it's a native Windows PE and it will pro appropriately recalculate the PE checksum header uh, and write it in the resulting um, artifacts, right? When you do a single pipeline run, uh, right now, and this is actually changing as we develop more things, but as of the writing of this presentation, which was somewhere in late September, early October of 2023, uh, three different zip files get produced. There's payloads and manifest information. There's click once packaging, and there's MSIX and Apex packaging. Uh, and uh, with uh, just to give you a sort of an example here, with payload inflation target size of around 20 meg or so, which is modest and insufficient, frankly, uh, typical artifact delivery stats are somewhere between 50 and 80 or so binary payload artifacts plus a manifest, 19 different XEs, 26 DLLs, four reflexive DLLs, six L XLLs, nine MSIX Apex packages, another nine click once packages. Over a gig of data is produced just with this marginal, fairly small run. And that number is, in fact, much larger now. So the idea is the tester or the uh, the pen tester, or the red teamer, opens up the manifest on the back end. They look through the different options and go, yeah, OK, I see I've got this, this, and this. I think I want to use this artifact and this artifact. I'm going to take those over to my lab you know, do the testing that's needed. And then if I'm satisfied with the, the evasive defensive characteristics, I'm going to go ahead and use those in my production test. Um, or in some cases, I believe our testers are just taking the artifacts and just going with it directly because they've got, they've developed enough trust in the process and enough trust in the, in the resulting artifacts to just, just run with it. Um, as an additional post-processing stage, uh, of this malware pipeline, uh, I've started to keep uh, something I call the history log database. And the history log database is uh, some SHA hashes. Um, essentially, um, and I'm doing a SHA-1, a SHA-256, SHA-512, I believe, of every artifact produced so that we can do some post-analysis after engagements to see uh, whether our customers have uploaded our artifacts to uh, various uh, databases, such as VirusTotal, for example, uh, and to see how these artifacts are traveling in the wild uh, and if they're traveling in the wild um, at all. Um, so we also, uh, as a part of that process, get to statistically count the kinds of artifacts per commit uh, in the uh, CICD pipeline. So here's an example of everything that occurred um, I believe it was between about September 26th and October the 4th or 5th, uh, which showed that there were 1,652 artifacts generated. Um, and then we put a, a metrics uh, figure around it. Uh, if a tester in the organization were, were to use uh, uh, two of these software artifacts uh, in, a, in an engagement, it probably saves between uh, 224 and 448 hours over this entire period of time, or uh, you know, another way to say that is, it takes a, a penetration tester between eight and sixteen hours worth of effort to generate a unique, highly evasive artifact, and this is saving them that time, right? Uh, so my intent here with uh, these statistics is to represent them uh, on a monthly basis uh, to the business team uh, at Black Hills, so that. Um, uh, there's a, a confidence level in uh, what our activities are, uh, because everything costs money, as you know, uh, but there's also, uh, uh, you know, a measurability to what we're doing. Uh, we can um, uh, appropriate the correct time uh, per customers over to some of these activities, right? Um, so some of the huge advantages, right? We get unique binary artifact delivery on every single pipeline run. We get a very large diversity of payload options, unique encryption keys for each run, unique shellcode encryption, unique source code obfuscation for C-sharp source code, unique machine code uh, encryption, flexibility to quickly implement new techniques. Uh, we can easily add more payload processing steps. 
We can do static analysis of binary, uh, binary artifacts. I'm sorry, I'm just sort of talking by reading the sentences. Let me rephrase that. In, in essence, one of the big benefits here is that the static analysis of binary artifacts becomes very, very much more difficult. But there's way more benefits to that than just that, which we'll talk about uh, towards the end here. The disadvantages. There are lots of dependencies. Can you imagine? Look, think about the things that I've already mentioned. We're compiling source code here for C Sharp, for C, C++, Golang, now Rust, right? On the back end, there is a ton of compilers and tool versioning that we need to take care of. And uh, it is one of the huge reasons or major motivations for me to choose Docker as part of the back end because I needed to be able to manage um, that that processing in in a way that that would would work uh, consistently, right? Because uh, that many dependencies is really really challenging. Now uh, there is also Windows native uh, back end build component of this as well. That's much much harder uh, to maintain. That's the Mage Make Apex uh, MS Build stuff. Um, uh, fortunately for us, less of the pipeline is going through the Windows native build environment than is going through the uh, Dockerized Linux environment. Um, so that's that's a good thing. Uh, the other thing that's a challenge is the speed of pipeline troubleshooting. An average pipeline run takes anywhere from three to ten minutes, and and as soon as we introduced Rust, that went to three to forty five minutes. Right, so. There's um, there's a lot of potential bloat here with the diversity and quantity of malware samples that we're able to produce. Um, there's also eight different Python 3 scripts just now, maybe even more now, to just maintain the dynamic child pipelines. Uh, there's a fairly high degree of sensitivity to configuration mistakes. Uh, some simple errors in the configuration YAML can actually completely blow up the pipeline. Uh, so I do end up with a somewhat of a support load from the red teamers and operators uh, to deal with that. Uh, we are getting better at that because we are actually automating the configuration front end as well. Uh, and that speaks to the fact that the operator use of Git is not really a good user interface, right? And then the other one is an interesting one, and that is this, what I call an operator overwhelming factor. You know, Joff, I used to go out and research a proof of concept, bring in a little bit of C sharp code or C code or Golang code and build it. And I knew exactly what I was dealing with, right? Now you're generating so many artifacts with so many different evasive uh, qualities to them. The immediate question is, which one do I use, right? And and that's that's not a trivial thing to answer. So part of this uh, effort um, is also um, something as we develop a little further where I'm leaning towards providing some presets for the configuration to fit certain defensive contexts. For example, we've done some recon. We know that a customer is using um, Sentinel-1, for example. Let Can we set the Sentinel-1 evasive pretext uh, in in the uh, configuration and then go ahead and generate malware, right? So we're starting to look at uh, even maturing it further, right? Just as an example, I recently polled our pen testers as I was writing this entire presentation, which is essentially a summary of two to three years of my brain, which is a really weird and wonderful place, right? And I asked them just a simple question. I said, hey, hey guys and gals, how many hours would it take you to manually produce the needed evasive binary artifacts that you get out of our pipeline. And the overall response was one to two days. And most people were leaning towards two days. And in some cases, the pen testers are like, look, my dev skills are really, really limited. And even somebody, uh, you know, I won't name any names, but there are people who I have a great deal of respect for in our company. There are many people I have a great deal of respect for in our company who have really good set of skills that still came forward and said, what you're doing is invaluable for me. It has taken so much workload off of my shoulders. Um, so we've really become a victim of our success here. And um, it's, it's, it's a good thing, right? Um, 
Another comment was made. Your work has changed how I operate. I now focus more on the op itself rather than all of that front effort on initial access operations, right? All that front end effort that you have to do. So many tools go into this, right? When developing, when debug, system informer, formerly known as process hacker, sys internals process explorer, API monitor, Visual Studio, Mono, MingW, Python, PECIV, DN spy, resource hacker. This, this thing is uniquely suited to me, by the way, because I'm one of these strange animals that can write code in just about any programming language I come across. And so... Uh, this was like to build this entire thing was like a match made in heaven for Joth, right? Because I have kind of that developer bent. I have that ability to operate and be evasive. And I sort of brought all these things together, right? .NET obfuscation. I actually wrote a complete custom source code templating system uh, that compresses and encrypts assemblies inside of artifacts and does reflexive loading and so on. Does uh, AMC bypass, for example, all of these things, right? There's a lot of .NET obfuscation technologies out there. I haven't published much of our secret source, but you can certainly look for things like Confuser EX, Code Deception, Obfusca, yet another obfuscator. There's lots of these things out there that you can lean into if you're interested. Uh, things like uh, NetClone, adaptive DLL hijacking, where we capture DLL code functionality and proxy function calls to legitimate DLLs. Uh, this is a great technique for apps that still have DLL path search issues. Uh, <clears throat> Microsoft, uh, the older version of Teams, now that they're starting to upgrade it, still had a DLL uh, sideload uh, bypass in it by uh, placing uh, uh, um, IP HLP API .dll or version .dll actually in a user writable directory. Unbelievable. Anyway, um, things like uh, the blog adaptive DLL hijacking, uh, Mono X gas uh, coupling, so many things. SysWhispers 3, a C library for implementing both direct and indirect kernel syscalls, integrated into the pipeline to dynamically regenerate upon each C compilation. Direct syscalls more challenging now. Uh, unfortunately, uh, if the CPU syscall instruction comes from a non DLL dot DL, a non NT DLL dot DLL mapped memory range. EDRs now consider it to be suspicious. So we have to move into a mode of indirect syscalls and bounce through NTDLL to make that kind of stuff work. A lot of research out there, a lot of shoulders of great people that I stand on and have integrated into this pipeline uh, to, to do this sort of work. Uh, Claire's virus there with uh, syswhispers. Um, and look, I could spend, frankly, five days probably talking about this. This is an overview presentation that talks about how I've brought a lot of this stuff together. But just to wrap it up, by implementing this uh, DevOps approach, you know, we have definitely saved valuable operating time, brought malware to a wider group of pen testers, some without the necessary dev skills or with limited dev skills, increased flexibility for post-processing packaging techniques, increased the consistency on our pen tester initial access ops, gained a lot of visibility into what artifacts are being produced and deployed. We've really provided a consistent platform to further the malware dev uh, and uh, provided a platform to integrate new, new malware generation frameworks. And finally, keep providing some adversary emulation and sporting fun, right? In the offense, defense kind of uh, arms race that we live in. Whole bunch of resources here. These are sort of a grab bag of various uh, blogs that I have uh, coded along the way. Um, and uh, sorry, read and uh, used in, with my coding along the way. And I'm always doing this stuff. Like I, my head's deep in this. Uh, a quick shout out to Tylus, uh, Matthew uh, Eilberg, Matt, if you're listening, you're probably not. Uh, Matt came on board with the team. Matt works with me as well. Uh, as well as uh, a, a couple of guys offshore. I, I won't mention any names. Uh, just really, really good good thing that we've got going on in the shop these days. Um, finally, I decided uh, that after Wild West Hacking Fest, I got such a huge positive response to this presentation that I created a repository on GitHub 
which allows you to begin building your own malware as a service. It essentially is a documented paint by numbers DIY approach. And I based it on uh, Scarecrow, which is Matt Eidelberg's uh, framework as a template uh, kind of system. So you are welcome to download that and to look at that approach and to get a sense of what I'm doing on a smaller scale. Uh, and potentially, uh, you know, be able to implement some of this uh, yourself. Um, I probably will, although I'm really busy guy, follow this up with also a blog that references this presentation and the malware as a service repo. And oh man, I'm out of breath and we are 53 minutes in. Let's yeah. bring Jason back in. <laughs> What's up, Josh? Well done, yeah. buddy. Uh, I'll give you a minute to, to just take a breath. Yeah. Take a breath. And so what I'll say to everyone that's here, if you're on Discord and you're currently job hunting, please post Hunter into the chat. Uh, we have a special role for you because we do weekly job hunting live streams. And we know that a lot of people right now are currently laid off or they're in between jobs or they're trying to transition to something else. And so we want to make sure that we're helping the people who are job hunting find the jobs that they're looking for. All right. So with that, <laughs> Josh. Yes. Is it malware bad? <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. So let's uh, let's talk about that. Um, remember that we are tasked with threat adversary em emulation, right? We could call it malware as a service, and yes, malware is uh, or can be uh, potentially bad. Um, but you know, I want everybody to sit back and think a little bit about what I've just presented with limited resources at Black Hills. We don't have a lot of resources. And over a couple of years here, been able to create this, this kind of animal to do this. Now, put yourself in the seat of a well-funded nation-state adversary uh, or very well-funded criminal enterprise uh, you have, it, it, it's a foregone gone conclusion to me that uh, that a, a better funded uh, true adversary is doing this sort of work at probably even greater scale. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah. I think yeah. we're doing our due diligence by bringing the same level of adversary emulation or similar level of adversary emulation to our customers uh, and doing it in a way that we can scale it a little bit better uh, for our entire company operation. But so, so, yeah. so in my brain, you know, I try to think of like how this relate to you know, protection and, and offense and all that. So I, I picture like way, way back in the day, there's castles and you're like, hey, can you break into this castle? And the guy walks up and he's throwing rocks at the castle and he's like, nope, couldn't get through. Like what you really need is that that trebuchet, trebuchet that like throws the like giant boulder and I was like you know what the trebuchet got through mm -hmm. uh, and you're like okay. you know that's not a that's not a bad analogy um this this concept of devops for um uh these artifact productions you can think of it as something that is producing a wide array of diverse ammunition for the trebuchet okay. oh. That's a really good analogy. One's yeah. got spikes in it. And you're like, oh. <laughs> <One blew> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we don't want that one. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So if you have questions for Joff, please go ahead and ask them again. I'm going to ask Joff to give his final thoughts. And then we're going to go uh, into overtime for a little bit, answer a couple questions, and then Joff will be done for today. Uh, but Joff, if you were going to take everything that you just talked about and sum it up in like a final takeaway, for the people who showed up today. And first of all, thank you so much for coming here today. If this was your first time on a Black Hills Information Security webcast, we hope you enjoyed it. And if this was over your head in any way, uh, keep coming back. Because uh, mm -hmm. it, it sometimes our webcasts are aspirational. Like you want to get to that point where you can learn. And if you already know these things, awesome. I hope it helps you in your CTFs and everything else in your daily job. Uh, but Joff, if you're going to sum all this up, what would you say? So... That's a very difficult question, but I I, I want to say a couple of things. One is um, um, our intent is to provide the best service to our customers that we can provide, first of all. Um, secondly, I, I would say to everybody and caution everybody, be nice out there. Do not use this 
uh, for um, nefarious purposes. And my, the idea is you could use this in your shop under regular contracted and lawful penetration testing engagements, uh, which is the appropriate thing um, to, to be able to do. Finally, um, I would say uh, read some of these blog references. If you're interested in, in furthering your malware development career, uh, or uh, and understanding, or maybe even coming at it from the other side, uh, doing some reversing of malware artifacts. Um, th th there's a lot of stuff out there, and just you know, there's a lot of great people doing great work, and you just have to you know dig around. I, there's some notable call outs. I love the MD Sec guys in England, uh, Dom and crew, uh, the Trusted Sec team are doing a great job. Um, you know, Outflank. Um, uh, our team, uh, you know, obviously, uh, and, and a lot of these guys are writing about this, um, th their work and, and openly sharing with the community. And uh, I think that's a that's a really good thing. So that was lots of summary. But anyway, yeah, I appreciate it, Josh. <laughs> for everyone listening and watching today, thank you so much. We'll stick around for a couple more minutes to answer the questions that you may have. If your questions didn't get answered, feel free to ask it again in Zoom or Discord, and we'll get to it as best we can. If this, uh, well... <laughs> I was just going to say thank you so much for joining us on the Black Hills Information Security Webcast. If you ever need Red Team, Thread Hunt, Pentest, any of that, as you can see, this is the kind That's of awesome. quality you're going to get. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, work with companies from small to the very, very big. Uh, and so if you're ever like, well, I don't think we're ready for Black Hills, like actually you are. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if you need us, uh, you know where to find us. All right. And that is okay. So that's the end of the that's that's the ending. That's the end of the show. All right, all right. So we'll stick around for a little bit. Uh, we'll answer some rapid fire questions. Uh, and so here we go. Uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to make another comment. Um, okay. So some of you may have uh, noticed um, the tendency for the defensive companies, EDR, XDR, and so on, uh, to to have become kind of hyper-focused on uh, shellcode delivery mechanisms, right? Process injection, things like that, right? It, you know, in terms of effectively emulating adversaries, we are starting to move away a little bit from that mode of operation because we believe that the defense industry has probably gotten too hyper-focused in that area. So that's uh, that's something to think about. Uh, Jock, can you kill your um, uh, slides just so that we can? Yeah, sure can. Screen? Cool. Uh, so one of the questions was like, do you believe that Red Team should have like an in-house development team that's doing this kind of work on a regular basis? Um, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, frankly, uh, I, I've, I'm finding, um, I mean, it all depends on the size of your company and the amount of resources you've got, of course. Uh, but uh, we've discovered a little bit by accident almost, but it's been more effective to sort of vertically integrate the stack and to have suppliers in our organization of the operator efforts. I'm one of those entities. I do believe it's a good thing to um, do. Um, you know, we also have uh, folks that uh, provide uh, operational support uh, for um, uh, tester architecture as well. So, um, yeah, I, I do think it's a good thing to do. I, I, I think, you, you know, to remain competitive, uh, you need to do this sort of thing. This is, we we are far from the days where you could break out uh, an old framework like um, Metasploit and succeed at penetration testing. Those days are way gone. Um, we're in, a, we're in a, a custom dev kind of environment. The other thing I should say is, um, if the attack surface has become too hard, uh, which in many cases people do think, uh, the idea is to pivot, right? Pivot into different areas of weakness. And, uh, um, oh, fat man, Will, you're killing me with the memes. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if we, we pivot into other areas, and, and many of you probably aware that, that, that Black Hills has a very, uh, very sizable focus on uh, uh, cloud um uh, operations these days as well because we're finding that uh, in 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 many cases that uh, cloud is uh, um, a weaker area right uh, is a lot of direct internet facing uh, vulnerabilities and usually misconfigurations that can be uh, used against you so 
Um, <laughs> right, the, the meme game is getting crazy out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what I did is I, I shared uh, Discord on here. So if you can see it, uh, also there's some private chat channels that you can also see. But if you're here, uh, check out the career chat, job hunting chat, open chat. Those are good places for you to find. Uh, we always talk about how the uh, the webcast is an hour long, but Discord is forever. And so you can keep the conversation going here. <laughs> Tough Aurelius, how much to have you as a mentor? <laughs> that's <laughs> that's a fun question. Yeah. Uh, how much, uh, if I could have uh, um, genetically uh, duplicated myself, so one of me can be on vacation at the same time as the other <laughs> one of me is being a mentor, and maybe another one of me is working, then maybe we can find a way to do that. But that uh, was that that movie, Multiplicity, with uh, yeah. Michael Keaton. <laughs> yeah, that was fantastic. I was, I was reading a comic book about that last night, where a person's made multiple copies of themselves, and they they keep going to like, "Are you me?" Uh, like, because he doesn't know. Yeah. Well, who in that movie, he is anymore. Make a, yeah. make a copy of a copy of a copy, mm. and they get worse and worse and worse. Yeah. It's just yeah. that's good. Movie. I, right, I so, will I will give a, a piece of advice out to every day buddy in the field learn how to program the machine, whether it's a Python course, a C course, a Golang course, I don't care. When you know how to program things, you are going to do better in this industry, period. Uh, so that's my uh, that's my advice to you. A job does teach for anti-siphon, but uh, we are not just sharing that right now. I mean, we, you can. You can go to anti-siphon.com training if you want to learn. Uh, which C2 is the best for initial access? This one's come up a few times. And this one, I feel like you're going to say the answer, it depends, but mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah. That, that's a tough one. I mean, it depends, right? It does. It truly does. There's some great products out there that are running around. Uh, Mythic, I think, is a great uh, uh, development entity um, that's done really well. Uh, BRC4, Brute Retail, they've done really well. Um, Cobalt Strike, you know, is still a great uh, product, um, you know, your own C2, somebody made the comment in there. Sure. Uh, you know, command and control channels are, are not uh, hard to actually write. And if you write your own, you, you've got a unique uh, command and control channel. Um, so whatever. Yeah. Uh, then another comment in there, whatever gets the job done. That's exactly right. It, it, it depends. Here's the challenge, though. Again, I will say that defensive uh operations um defensive products are, have gotten really really highly focused on this idea of defeating c2 right uh so we need to go at it in different ways uh and that could be uh point software to do a specific task uh go in and rip off a whole bunch of data and leave you know something like that rather than a full c2 framework you know start to look at things in a different way um you know, another comment, caveman there, less is more these days. That's exactly right, right? Um, you, you know, you really have to, um, uh, I think, I'll just make another comment. With a lot of C2 frameworks, what a lot of folks are finding is they could use some highly obfuscated techniques, such as what we've just all talked about in terms of the pipeline, to actually establish command and control. But once you've established command and control, what can you do then? Uh, because a lot of people's environments now, if they're mature, have gotten uh, gotten their controls so well tuned that you can't even like like you're in a straitjacket once you get that C2 established. So you know you can pat yourself on the back and say congratulations, uh, you established your C2. But if you can't do any post exploitation activities after you establish it, what good is it to you, right? Um, so that's a that's another. Um, Another challenge in the industry. We're, we're in an interesting industry pivot point, I think, where the idea of a, a, a C2 post-exploitation um, uh, actions that we used to do has gotten so well instrumented on the defense that we're starting to pivot away from it a little bit and go, well, we have to we have to come at this in a different direction because um, because the, the arms race has kind of caught up with us, right? Um, yeah. And we're going to see. We're going to see things continue to evolve like that. Uh, I just want to make a comment that the community is awesome. They're currently answering that question with their own insights and perspective. And I, I'm watching it. It's, it's really fabulous. That is exactly why we have Discord because mm -hmm. you know, we're one. Yeah, you know, we're just a few people, but you are many, and so you can help each other with your uh, yeah. those questions. Uh, this question came up 
twice. I want to make sure. How do, how do you feel about paid tools such as OST Outflank Security Toolkit, which provides a similar service like malware as a service? Yeah, I, I, I um, you know, uh, I, they're going into business, put hanging out their shingle, uh, doing uh, malware as a service style. Um, I, I think that's a fine uh, thing for them to be doing. Um, what I don't know, though, is who their clients are um, and, uh, you know, whether they are, um, and I haven't looked at that particular service, just full disclaimer, but whether they are they are completely focused on the ethical hacking penetration testing industry or whether they have a wider focus that includes maybe a little less honest and more nefarious kind of activities, and, and that would bother me a little bit. Um, so, um, but the fact that they're doing it, uh, I mean, good for them. Uh, one of the comments that was made to me after I presented this material at Wild West Hackenfest was, um, can I buy it as a service? <laughs> that was one of the first questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, the answer is uh, no, <laughs> not right now, and probably no uh, in per perpetuity because <laughs> I don't think John wants to spin off another company right now. No, no, we're all I, a little I, tired with the ones he has. We're all a little tired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the uh, next company he's making is a, a meat company. Like, like <laughs> with a, the Wagyu. Yeah, with the Wagyu bridge. beef. With Wagyu uh, beef and, and burger yeah. flipping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a uh, food yeah. truck? Are we having a food truck? It's, it's not a food there? truck. Okay. It's just okay. like get strand meat. Strand meat. And that, I think he's going to call it something different. <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this yeah. question. Sorry, this Go question ahead. a couple yeah. times. Uh, what should XDR, EDR be hyper-focused on? Oh yeah, so yeah. that that's a yeah, that's a. Um, I think they should remain uh, focusing on that post exploitation techniques um, uh, in, from the perspective of the the goals that the attacker is going after. Um, you know, not not necessarily down to the exact command line they're using, but more again, you look at MITRE framework. Um, you know, what is it? what is the attacker trying to achieve um, overall goal? And then what falls out of that is what are the various techniques they're using to try to achieve that? The XDR folks need to be focused on that, I think. Um, um, but there's a lot of different opinions, right? Um, that initial uh, access operations side um, is, you know, a lot of these defense companies have been right hyper-focused there as well. Um, I, You know, the other comment I'll make is, the bigger the product gets from a defensive perspective, the more attack surface they actually present to us as well. Um, because, you know, uh, as we all know, a complexity is kind of the um, the enemy in a little bit, um, not in a little bit, in quite a lot of ways uh, to uh, to effective um, defense. Uh, so, more, you know, more complexity is going to going to give us a lot more uh, potential to attack the product itself, uh, which is dangerous. So I was distracted by strand meat. Uh, I can already picture the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Dieter nailed it. Yeah, like, a strand meats company. <laughs> it's uh, all right. Uh, yeah. Last question. Last question. And then uh, they tagged you, which made it very nice. Uh, how do you feel about polymorphing malware technologies, which got demoed a year ago? How would yeah. that look like when you deploy it using AI based C2 infrastructure? I feel like we all need a drink after this question, first of all, because of the <laughs> the number of potential acronyms that are yeah. uh, either enclosed already in the question or potentially spring from the imagination after you uh, read the question. Yeah. Um, uh, it scares me uh, to think about the potential uh, for AI generated malware in general um the reason being uh uh is um it's gonna work uh mm -hmm. and um it is it is possible to to land a malware sample that um would uh, uh would be very effective at evading multiple technologies um and uh, yeah, I guess that's the world we live in to some extent, but it's um, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, yeah. I have not heard you got get that nervous and like calm and worried answering a question ever. So I was like, oh, <laughs> oh no. Yeah. 
This is serious. Yeah, it's it's sort of a question where you you, you want to say <laughs> like it's all it's all fun until we get hurt, right? Um, and sure. what's happening in the world of AI right now um, uh, is uh, is frightening. I think uh, large language mod models can be um, abused um, significantly, and uh, we're we're going down an, an interesting road. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Tom just put it there: AI offense versus AI defense. Right, war of the machines, uh, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Fortunately, right now, I will say that the large language models make a lot of mistakes. Um, but having said that, I haven't actually spent time with a fully paid up AI key to a very well-developed large language model and started going down that road. Um, if and when I do, which I probably will, uh, I'll, I'll come back and revisit because I'm. let me tell you, I know it's going to get scary. Yeah. Uh, someone just asked if you have a podcast, and I was just thinking about the Joff's Malware and Cooking podcast. That's uh, right. right. Uh, we did uh, we did Joff and Ke Kelly talk about Kelly. cooking in, in the uh, in the green room at Wild West Hacking Fest. That was my favorite part. It was and, awesome. and, and and Jason and I think Deb, you were there too, yep. maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was um, there. Yeah. Got to sit with us and listen to us. Uh, we were uh, guests on your show. Remember? Yeah, yeah. it was great. Yeah. It was, it was good. It's a pity we didn't broadcast it though. I know. Um, I know it's a shame. It do so well. I, I don't have a podcast. Um, it seems to me that I have a talent for conveying knowledge to people though. So I've I will that. continue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will continue to develop material uh, and, and deliver it. Um, I, like I said, I have the, the Python class. Um, I'm going to consider putting together um, a, um, DevOps for security professionals short course um, out of this material because there's a tremendous amount there. Um, um, I, I need to somehow marshal enough interns to maintain everything that I want to teach. That's the that I'm having a scaling challenge right now. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> we'll plus, I, plus, I want you to write that book. So. <laughs> oh yeah, Jason wants me to write a book too. Um, yeah. So. Uh, Look, hey, Discord community, if you, um, knowing me, knowing that I've talked about regular expressions, knowing that I've talked about malware and shellcode and, and DevOps and all these uh, different things, um, uh, you know, if, if you had a vote on on the next class that I wrote, <laughs> let's, let's throw it out there. And I said it was uh, DevOps for security professionals. There's one choice. Um, Malware dev techniques would be another choice. Um, then possibly a different programming language course uh, like Golang for security professionals. Tell me what you'd want. Why don't we just throw it out there? <laughs> All right, let's do sure. it. Sure, you're going to be busy, but sure. <laughs> All right. Malware uh, dev well, techniques. So the 283 of you that stayed <laughs> yeah, around, nice. thank you so much. Uh, we have a webcast coming up next week, which is Ooh, ours. It's exciting. Uh, when I say ours, it's the content community team. We're going to introduce the InfoSec Survival Guide and some of the contributors that helped make it possible. The week after that, we have Patterson Cake coming in to talk about some kind of incident response thing. Uh, and then BB is talking about web app pen testing. And then we go on a hiatus for two weeks because of Christmas and New Year's. And then we come back with a schedule already planned all the way until April of next year, kicking things off with John wow. Strand talking about 2024 mm. and how to get involved with the community and, they, and things. They, so, they authorized yeah. a holiday for us? Who did that? You. I, yeah, yeah, You're going to be busy yeah. writing all these classes. So yeah. I don't yeah. <laughs> 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 all right, good all stuff. right everybody thank you so much for joining us joff thank you for sharing your knowledge with the community we always appreciate it and, and it was we fun. had yeah uh you came in we had someone else scheduled for today they couldn't make it and so joff's like i got something and i was like okay uh, she had was, a baby that's a good reason <laughs> i wasn't oh, gonna like, say, i wasn't gonna like wait say. wait Wait, Melissa had a baby and she was at work the next day come on i, said, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I am not a part of this <laughs> not the conversation i wanted to have i'm just time. kidding i'm just kidding. all right thank you all so much we'll see you next time we appreciate you and uh if you stick around the discord we stick around the discord so we'll see you there all right take care everybody
Ryan, Thanks, everybody. kill the fire. <laughs>